Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, for legal geeks like myself who spend our evenings reading through memorandum on opinions that nobody other than me cares about, occasionally you come across a little nugget, a little ruling where you go, whoa, whoa, wait a second. If that analysis is the way it works here, then why wouldn't it work that way here as well? And you can begin to draw analogies and begin to see perhaps what courts might do with other issues, not related, but still involving the same analysis. Today, I'm gonna to teach you about a case, not a lot of people are talking about it, but I think it gives us a real interesting insight into what the Supreme Court may have to do in the matter of United States v. Rahimi. So today, let's spend a few minutes, let's geek out on it a little bit, and let's talk about the case that no one knows, but might tell us everything. Okay, so the case we're talking about today is United States v. Kersey. It comes out of the Fifth Circuit, and of course, if it comes out of the Fifth Circuit, we know who likely won that case, and it was not the United States government. This is yet another example of the Fifth Circuit taking a wrecking ball to various previous laws. Now, just to give you a little background so you can understand, Mr. Kersey had been convicted of an offense in which he was on supervised probation. So essentially he's out of custody at this point, presumably had served a commitment. He's out of custody, he's being supervised by a probation officer. And then there's an allegation that Mr. Kersey had violated his probation. The Department of Corrections, probation department, whoever it was that was supervising him, essentially just picked him back up and remanded him into custody. There was a brief court hearing which consisted only of the judge reviewing what the allegations against Mr. Kersey was, finding that there was sufficient evidence and throwing his ass back in jail. Mr. Kersey appealed that and it ended up all the way in the Fifth Circuit. And here's what the Fifth Circuit said. The Fifth Circuit said, hey, listen, uh, Mr. Kersey is not a particularly nice guy and Mr. Kersey probably did deserve to go back to jail. The problem though is you afforded him zero due process opportunity before you sent him away. You never gave him a chance to confront his accusers. You never gave him a chance to put on his own evidence. You never gave him a chance to attack the weight of the evidence against him. You didn't even give him a chance at a meaningful hearing. Does that sound familiar, hmm? And then when you consider what one of the central issues is in United States v. Rahimi, and you consider what one of the big gripes is that we have all the time about red flag laws, you see how United States v. Kersey becomes a very interesting looking glass into where a court may properly analyze the constitutionality of these types of legislative schemes. Now, an amicus brief filed by both the Cato and Goldwater Institute on behalf of Mr. Kersey specifically pointed out, notably, there was no requirement that the respondents be advised beforehand that issuance of the order will render it unlawful for them to possess firearms, no requirements that they will be provided with counsel, no requirements that the issuing court make any specific factual finding, no provision for a heightened standard of proof, as this court has held is constitutionally mandated when individual interests at stake in a state proceeding are both particularly important and more substantial than mere loss of money. And that's the thing, when we're talking about deprivation of rights, either taking a person's firearms or locking them up, okay, Many states are operating on a burden of proof on these civil hearings under a preponderance of evidence. The only state I know that at least tries to protect its citizens a little bit more is the state of Maine. Under their yellow flag laws, they actually require clear and convincing evidence. And you see, that's really the issue in Rahimi. It's not about whether or not Mr. Rahimi should have been armed because I think all of us can agree he's the last person in the world that should have been armed. But it's the method by which they utilize to disarm him that's the critical component of what's being considered there. Now, interestingly, Judge Ho was one of the three judges who also authored the opinion in Rahimi when it came out of the Fifth Circuit. He also concurred in this opinion here. And I want you to pay careful attention to where the judge is coming from. The district court found Jeffrey Kersey guilty of assaulting his girlfriend, among other offenses, and sentenced him accordingly. 
but it did so without affording him the right to confront and cross-examine adverse witnesses. So the majority vacates his sentence despite meaningful evidence that he is a dangerous criminal. I agree and therefore concur. I write separately to observe that the court grants relief not because it is insensitive to domestic violence or the safety of Kersey's girlfriend, but because it is sensitive to the constitutional rights of the accused. In that respect, the decision today reminds me of our decision in Rahimi. We initially upheld Rahimi's conviction, but we later reversed ourselves in light of Bruin. Bruin involves the Second Amendment, not criminal procedure. But Bruin admonishes us not to treat the Second Amendment as a second-class right, subject to an entirely different body of rules than the other Bill of Rights guarantees. And the court has construed other provisions, like the First Amendment, to require procedural safeguards to protect substantive rights, like freedom of speech. And that is the $64,000 question that needs to be answered in Rahimi and needs to be dealt with on all of these issues relating to red flag laws. We recognize, lawful and responsible gun owners will recognize that there is a small, a very small segment of population that may currently be armed that probably should not be armed. However, however, the methods by which we utilize to disarm these otherwise dangerous individuals fail miserably in even coming close to affording any level of constitutional protection. Listen, we'll go ahead and link up the ruling down below so that you can geek out on it for yourself. The case, once again, is United States v. Kersey. Now, listen, if you got any other questions about that or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington Gun Law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is right down there in the description box. Now, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.